Good morning again. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament book, um, Prophet Jeremiah. And um, before we get started, though, I just kind of want to remind you what kind of the theme we're, we're walking through and, and what we're looking at in Scripture. Uh, it's all throughout Scripture, and it's, it's about being uh, a fruit-bearing Christian. Um, that is what gives God the glory as we worship Him and live our lives in light of Him and what He's done for us is that we would bear much fruit. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said that um, my Father has chosen you so that you would go and bear much fruit. We just saw that in uh, John chapter 15 um, last week, and we talked about what it took to bear fruit. God is going to prune us. He prunes. Every good gardener knows to bear more fruit that you need to prune and, and prune and cut back. So in one season you're cutting back, but in the next you're bearing much fruit. So you prune so that there will be fruit in your own life. There's going to be pruning. And Jesus said, my father is the gardener. He prunes us. And in those pruning, though, is, it's a very painful process. And sometimes we don't understand what's going on. But even in the midst of that pruning, Jesus says we need to remain in him. Because apart from him, we can do what? Nothing. We can do nothing. And I ask you the question, do you genuinely believe that? That you can do nothing and if I can do nothing apart from Jesus, if I cannot bear fruit that glorifies Him, then it should rearrange how I do my life. I should look at my priorities and say, am I remaining in Him? Do my priorities say that I depend on Jesus? Because apart from Him, I can do nothing of eternal value. Remember, Jesus' nothing is different than our nothing. It doesn't necessarily mean nothing, but it just means if you want to do anything of eternal value and glorify God with your life, you need Jesus. You need to remain in Him. So there's going to be pruning and there's going to be, you're, you have to remain. Today we're going to look at the basic level of what it means to be an actual fruit-bearing Christian. And we're going to see in, in chapter 17 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is actually going to, he is God's mouthpiece. And, and God chose Jeremiah when he was a young, at, the, at a young age. And we call Jeremiah the weeping prophet because there are times in Scripture where you see Jeremiah actually weeping over the sins of Israel and how far they have gone astray from God, the God's chosen people, how they have went into idolatry. And so he calls them the, he, known as the weeping prophet. But Jeremiah had a hard road ahead of him. God pretty much told him, he said, look, you're going to bring all these things to pe these people and prophesy, and they're really not going to listen to you, but I'm going to be with you. And so we see here in chapter 17, though, Israel is in a time of, pros of prospering. They're, they're in a time of prospering. And they're prospering, and God is, they think God is blessing them, but it's actually the opposite. See, there's a Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 17, 1 that says, uh, Better is a dry crust and a house full of peace than a house full of feasting and strife. That's so true. Better a dry crust with peace than a house full of feasting and strife. And that's what we see with the Israelites in this moment. They are in a time of prosperity, but yet they are far from God. The cost, there's a cost with this prosperity, and it's actually um, them being away from God. On the outside, they look like they're prospering, but on the inside, they are far from God. And the reason they're far from God is because they have put their trust in other things. They have put their trust, uh, Jeremiah is going to say, you have put your trust in mankind. You have put your trust in flesh. And he's going to use imagery here. He's going to use imagery of two types of trees. One tree represents those who trust in human flesh. The other tree represents those who trust in the Lord. And so today we're going to see at the basic level, what does it mean to be a fruit-bearing Christian? Well, it means to trust. Can you genuinely say that you trust the Lord? That if it was, if your life just solely depended on the Lord, you were okay because all of your trust is in the Lord. See, we trust a lot of things, don't we? We trust uh, uh, the medical field. We, we trust in uh, people to lead us. And we trust pilots when we get on the plane. We hope that they didn't just stay, as a commercial, commercial says, in a hotel six, that motel six, that they actually know what they're doing as they're flying. We trust doctors, right? When they, we go under... For surgery, we trust that they know what they're doing, right? We trust in a lot of things, but all of our trust should solely be in Jesus. You're trusting in that chair you're sitting in right now. You didn't even think about it, did you? You just sat down. 
That's the type of trust that God wants us to have in Him. Where we don't think, we don't, we don't even think twice about it. All our trust is in Him. We simply rest in Him. That's what it means to trust in the Lord. To trust in the Lord means to simply rest in Him. Are you resting in the Lord today because of all your trust is in Him? I know we can look at our world, and like I said earlier, there is so much upheaval and things going wrong. But in the midst of that, are you trusting in God to make it right? Or are you trusting in yourself, in your own strength, or somebody else? See, at the most basic level, though, that's what determines if you're going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Where is your trust? But before we move on, I kind of want to remind you, though, of what fruit we're looking for. You, you, so if you were to, at, during that day, if you were to ask just a normal Israelite walking down the road during this time, and you would ask them, are you bearing fruit? They would say, yeah, look at our life. Look at our life. For instance, you look at fig trees. They look lush and beautiful with green trees, but they're not always bearing fruit. And that was similar to what was going on with the Israelites. On the outside, they thought, yeah, we're, we're doing great. But on the inside, they were far from God because they were not trusting him. So they looked fruitful, but they weren't. You see, Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he lists out the fruit of the Spirit. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are evidence, right, of the fruit in your life. Those are evidence of the Spirit in your life. If you look back at where Paul is writing this in Galatians 5, he, he's talking about the difference between the flesh and the Spirit. You see, the flesh is what we're made of. It's our natural uh, instinct. It's who we are. It's what we're born into, the flesh. And he says, but there's also something supernatural out there, and it's called the Spirit. And he says, lean on the Spirit, but there's a war going on. And you know this war. I, I am no different than you are because I know myself. I know this war every single day, and it's between the flesh and the Spirit. It's like tug-of-war. You ever played a game of tug-of-war? I love a good game of tug-of-war. But it's like a life constantly. You're constantly being pulled between the flesh and the Spirit. The flesh is opposed to what the Spirit wants to do in your life. That's why Paul says we have got to crucify our flesh. We've got to crucify our desires because it is opposed to what the Spirit wants to do in your life. And so he says walk in step with the Spirit. And so if you walk in step with the Spirit, these things will be evident in your life. So if you need to walk in step with the Spirit, what does it mean? That you can't produce these types of fruit. You can't produce Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control on your own. You can't do it. Because naturally, you were the opposite of what these say. Look at your life yesterday. Think about it. Did you have joy? Did you have peace? Were you patient? Were you kind? Did you have goodness? Were you faithful to the Lord? Were you gentle? And did you have self-control? You see, those are things I look back yesterday, and I'm like, no, I didn't have all of those in my life. So what does it mean? I need someone else to do that for me. I need the Spirit of God in my life working these things for me. You see, it's very important that we understand the preposition of here that Paul says. Why? Because this is not fruit that we produce. It's fruit that the Spirit produces in us. The fruit of the Spirit. Notice it's singular, fruit. It's not fruits, but it's fruit. It's not an exhaustive list. It's a list of the types of characteristics that the Spirit produces in you when you choose to plant the root of your faith or when you plant your trust in the gospel. See, where is your trust today? Is it planted in who God is and what he has done for you? Or is your trust planted in yourself and your ability or planted in somebody else or someone else? You see, when it comes to producing fruit of the Spirit, here's the bad news. You can't do it. I can't do it. But the good news is God can and he wants to. That's the good news today. God can do it in you. What you are unable to do, God can do in you. And listen, I'm here to tell you that he wants to produce this in your life. You need to tell yourself this. I can't, but he can. I can't, but he can. You can also say, not I, but Christ. It's not I, but Christ. And so here's what I don't want you to do when we read Jeremiah 17. I don't want you to hear do better, be better, live better. Do better, be better, live better. We've, we've tried that. You see, if you walk into a normal bookstore, if you walk in Books A Million, I love to go in Books A Million, but if you walk into their, their biggest section is going to be the self-help section. That it's going to tell you to do better, live better, be better, try harder. Here's seven steps to a better life. 
But those always fail because we're incapable of doing better, living better, and being better. We've all tried, right? And it's like this cycle. We get back and we say, tell ourselves, well, I should have tried harder today. I should have done better. Or, or I should have just tried a little harder to be kind and to be gentle and to have patience. But then here comes tomorrow and you're back in the same situation. And so the gospel is never try harder and God will be pleased with you. Just tighten your spiritual belt. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is look to Jesus and his ability to save, sustain, and sanctify you. And ultimately produce fruit in you and through you. So this means we need another source, right? We need another source to produce in us what we are unable to produce on our own. And as I said last week, what if this year in 2021 was the most fruitful year for you and your family? Not because of anything that you feel like you have to do, but because of everything that you trust in what God has already done for you. That's how this year is going to be the most fruitful year for you in our church and in your family, is that we don't try harder, but we trust more. We trust in the finished work of what Christ did for us, and we rest in the gospel. Where is your trust today? And so this is what I want to answer today. At the most basic level, what does it take to be a fruitful Christian? You see, what's the difference at the most basic level, at the deepest level, past the easy Sunday school answers that say, do this, right? We all hear that. Do this or do that. Believe this and everything will be okay. So what's the difference between someone who bears fruit and someone who doesn't? How can I become a fruitful believer? Well, let's, let's look at that in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 5. Remember, uh, Israel is prospering on the outside. They feel like everything is going great, that they are producing, they are being fruitful for God, but ultimately they're not because of where their trust is. And listen to what Jeremiah says in verse 5. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the person who trusts in mankind. He makes human flesh his strength. And he bear, and his heart turns from the Lord. Look how those two are tied together. When you trust in yourself or you trust in human strength, you are ultimately turning away from the Lord. He says in verse 6, he will be like a juniper or a shrub in the Arabah or the desert. He cannot see when good comes, but dwells in the parched places, in the wilderness, in a salt land where no one lives, he says. The person who trusts in the Lord, who's confident indeed is the Lord, is what? Is blessed. He will be like a tree planted by water. It sends a root out towards a stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes and its foliage remains green. It will not worry in a year of drought or cease producing fruit. Verse 9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and uncurable. Who can understand it, Jeremiah says. I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart to give to each according to his way, according to what his accounts deserve. Now go down to verse 14. Jeremiah says, in light of all this, he says, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved, for you are my praise. And so in Jeremiah chapter 17, when you look at all these verses with verse 14 in mind, and, and the rest of verse 5 through 10, what is the primary difference between the two trees? So we have the two trees here and the imagery of the two trees God is using to show Israel who they really are. But what is the difference between the two trees? The primary difference between these two trees is location and source. The difference between these two trees is simple. It is their location and their source. You see, the location and source of your trust is the difference between a fruit-bearing Christian and a non-fruit-bearing Christian. The difference between a fruit-bearing Christian and a non-fruit-bearing Christian is the location and the source of their trust. So this morning, where are you placing your trust in? Is it in yourself? Is it in somebody else? Is it in something else? Where is the location of your trust? What, what is the source of your trust? Wherever the location is, that's your source. Whatever you place your trust in, that's what you're depending on to give you peace and to hope. That's your source. That's where your source is going to come from. But we see the outcome is different for these two trees. The outcome of where your, your trust 
is located in the source of your trust, the outcome is different for the two trees. And so the first thing we need to see here is this. Fruitfulness is determined by the location and source of your trust. Fruitfulness is determined by the, by the location and source of your trust. If you want to be a fruit-bearing Christian this year and, and outwardly show that you are connected to the vine, connected to Jesus, then it's going to be determined by your location of your trust and your source. Location, location, location. You, you've heard that before, right? And all the real estate agents said, amen. Right? Amen. Because location, 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 that matters when it comes to real estate. All right, the piece, the, the, the determining factor of, of, of a property and the value of a property is, is highly determined by where it's located. When we first got to this community and, and, and we wanted to actually buy a home, we, we had to look long and hard. We had to pray and ask God to open doors because the location here is great. And where we live, it's a blessing. It's a blessing where we live. And we, we enjoy where we live because we love the location. We, we think our, our home has value not because of where we live, but because of the location, right? And so that is the same for, for us. You see, similarly, where we place our trust determines the outcome of the course of our life. Did you hear what Jeremiah said? He said, where you place your, the location of your trust and the source of it determines if you're going to live a cursed life or a blessed life. A cursed life or a blessed life. You see, when you see cursed in Scripture, it's always about somebody being in lack. It's that the things that they once had was taken away from them. They're not going to be able to produce anything. You, you look at Cain and Abel. You know, one of the brothers gave an offering and God cursed Cain. Why? Because, because his offering was selfish. He placed his own trust in, in his ability, not in God. And so God cursed him. And he said, you're going to work long and hard. Long and hard. And so what happens is what was, what was once his, an inheritance is not his no more because he was cursed. So Jeremiah is saying that the difference between putting, placing where you place your trust and your source is the difference between living a cursed life and a blessed life. And so as Jeremiah stated, it's the difference from being a dried up and withering person or the difference between being a flourishing, fruitful Christian. Listen, everybody in here, I would hope that we would want to be that tree. We would, we would want to be that flourishing, fruitful Christian. We don't want to be the withering shrub in the desert, dried up, looking for substance. We, we, we don't want to be that one. And so Jeremiah gives us a compare and contrast of two different types of people, right? Those who trust in mankind or themselves or those who trust in the Lord. You see, it's easy for us to come in here and say, well, I trust the Lord, so I hope as we go on, it will be evident to all of us if our trust is really in the Lord this morning. And so the two imagery is compare and contrast of the two, right? You have those who trust in mankind and those who trust in the Lord. And so it's portrayed in the imagery of a shrub versus a tree. I asked Eli, I love to uh, talk to Eli about my sermons throughout the week, and I said, Eli, if you could be one or the other, a shrub or a tree, which one would you want to be? He said, well, I'd want to be a shrub. I said, well, you're actually not helping me out here. Why would you want to be a shrub? He said, well, because if I was a tree, people would look at me and want to chop me down for firewood. I don't want to be burnt up. Amen. Amen. I should have shared the gospel to him in that moment, right? But, but you know, in this imagery, don't be the shrub, be the tree. Don't be the shrub, be the tree. And so he gives us two of those. So the shrub, the shrub portrays, it's, it lives in a desert, a salt land. There's no life there. It's not vibrant. It is not flourishing. It's uninhabited. No other life around, no animals or other plants. This is where the shrub is located. This is where it is getting its source of life. You see, Jeremiah 16b says, he cannot see when good comes. So this person, the shrub, who trusts in mankind or trusts in their own strengths and abilities, he says, he cannot see when good comes. Listen, he says, when good comes. It's not that good does not come. It's coming, but the person that trusts in themselves, they can't see it. Listen, God could be pouring out blessing after blessing on this type of person, and they don't even know it. They don't even realize it. You know, that should be sobering to us. 
You see, it's not that God is not blessing you or, or there is no good in your life. It's just that you're, you're trusting in something that dries up the good. You see, God could be blessing your life and, and good could be happening, but yet you can't see it all. You can't see it all because you're trusting in yourself and something else. And so even the good that come in your life, it's not good enough. And even the, I was talking to, to one of our missionaries and Daphne, she wouldn't mind me sharing. And we were talking and, and, and I said, how are things going? And she said, we're in another national lockdown right now. And I can imagine when we went through that, we know how difficult that is, especially for the church. And they're in a national lockdown right now. And I said, oh, how are y'all doing? She says, God is still good and good things are still happening. God is still blessing us. And I got to thinking, look, if she was trusting in herself and her abilities and and just looking at everything that was wrong, she would not be able to see the good that God is still doing. Why? Because her trust is not in mankind to fix everything. Her trust is in God. And because of that, she can be a flourishing Christian, even in the midst of terrible circumstances. She can see the good in the midst of all the bad. Why? Because her trust is not in herself or somebody else. It's, it's in the Lord. And so listen, if you put your, your trust in your abilities or you put your trust in somebody else, you're never going to see when the good comes. You're always going to see bad. Nothing ever good happens to me. God never blesses me. No, he is blessing you. You just can't see it. You're incapable of knowing when God is blessing you because your eyes is not fixed on him. Your eyes is fixed on you. And if your eyes are fixed on you and somebody else, it's never going to be enough. And so the shrub is incapable of seeing where God is at work. Do you want to know where God is at work, even in the midst of not good circumstances? Make him your trust. Make him the source of of life for you. And then he says, and um, so and then the, the contrast from the shrub who lives in the desert, no good thing is withering. There's no life. He's alone because his trust is in himself or somebody else. His trust is in mankind. But the, the difference, though, in the tree, he says, he does not fear when heat comes. He's like a tree planted by the waters. His root grows down. But he does not fear when heat comes. You see, all of us get bad news, don't we? All of us get bad news. All of us have things that happen to us that are disappointing. We all do. Nobody is perfect. We all have those days where we get the bad news, not the news we were necessarily hoping for. Someone comes up to you and says, do you want the... The bad news or the good news first? I mean, there's going to be good news, but there's also going to be bad news. And so all of us get it. But we all have our setbacks, and some are major and some are not so major. But listen, Jeremiah says, those who trust and hope is the Lord isn't afraid. Don't you want to live that type of life where you're not constantly full of fear, but you're constantly full of faith? Don't you want to live a life where you're not gripped by the things that happen outside of you because you know you have something inside of you that no one can take away? The only thing that's possible and the only way that's possible is if your hope and trust is in the Lord. And it's not in yourself or somebody else to fix a problem. Because we all are going to get bad news. But when that bad news comes, are you going to fear it? Are you going to worry? Is fear going to grip your heart? Or are you going to respond by faith because you say, you know what, my trust is in the Lord, the one who is over it all. I have a source outside of this world. I have a living water. I have, my trust is located in someone who's not of this world, but over it. My trust is in the Lord. And then he says, is not anxious for the year of drought. So you have the heat coming. There, when bad news comes, the drought, what if those bad news stay? The drought. What if, what if the bad news comes to you and it's here to stay for a long time? It's going to linger. You're going to be dealing with this for a long time, but the tree still, still bears fruit in the drought. Even when life is not going the way we want it to, even, even when things are happening to us and we're not comfortable with the way life is, and it may last a long time, we can still be fruitful. See, I I believe this is where we are now as a church. This is where we are now as a church. We don't know how long this is going to be happening to us. We don't don't know how long these effects are going to take place. But we still have the responsibility to bear fruit. We still have the responsibility as a church to flourish. 
we still have the responsibility as a church to preach the gospel. We still have the responsibility as a church to love our neighbors. But for us to do that, we have to put our trust in the Lord. We don't know how long this is going to take. The heat's coming and we may be in a drought for a long time, but that's okay because God is in control. Our trust is not in anyone else or in ourselves. It's in the Lord. And because of that, I can still be a flourishing, fruitful Christian in spite of circumstances that are, that are not so good. And so listen, don't blame your circumstances of, of our lack of flourishing as a church. We can't do that. We have no excuse. The only excuse we have is that we're not putting our trust in the Lord if we're not flourishing and being fruitful. We've got to put our, our faith in Him and trust in Him. So let me ask you this. We have to ask ourselves, where is the location of your trust? Which of the tree imagery represents your life? Which one are you right now? Are you withering in a desert? No hope. Everything's bad. You can never see anything good. You feel like God's not blessing you. Where are you at? Who or what are you trusting in? Is your trust located in yourself? Is your trust located in Washington? Is your trust located in a bank account? Listen, when you examine your life, what fruit is evident? Is it worry, anxiety? Do you feel like you're struggling, a struggling withered shrub in the desert? Nothing good happens. Everything, I get nothing but bad news. When is the good ever going to come? Is that you? Could it be that your trust is located in the wrong source? Could it be that you placed your trust in, in the wrong source? Listen, our hope is built not on medical salvation or on economic prosperity. Our hope is built on Jesus. That's a foundation better than anything life can give. And you know what? Death cannot take that away. Not even death can take that away. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So here on earth, I get the benefits of Christ. And even when I die, I get it even the more. And so where is your trust this morning? Our hope is built on Jesus. He is a strong foundation. As that hymn says, all other ground is what? Sinking sand. Do you feel like you're sinking? You feel like you can't come up and get air? Well, could it be that you're, the source of your trust and the location of your trust is in somebody else or something else or even in yourself and not in the Lord? Listen, God becoming the source of your life and the source of your trust is not just adding a little bit of God to our lives. See, I think a lot of us live in this state of frustration because we feel like, well, God, I'm, I'm going to church, I read my Bible, I pray. But there are still parts of your life where you're frustrated because those are the areas where you not have fully leaned on God and trusted in Him. You're still frustrated in certain areas because you are still trusting in yourself to provide. You're frustrated in certain areas of your life because you're still, you're still hoping on somebody else to come through. When you do that, you're putting unrealistic expectations on yourself and somebody else. Listen, we have one Savior, and His name is Jesus. So we can't think that we'll just get a little bit of God and we're actually making Him our source. Listen, making God the source of your trust, it means making God your source in all things for the present and the unknown future. It's that I make Him the source of everything in my life. My joy, happiness, peace, all comes from God, not from myself or somebody else. And if we're honest, all of us have set of things that we depend on for security and we look to for significance, don't we? We all have things that we look to to give us safety and security and significance. But to be a fruitful Christian means letting go of everything else. Letting go of everything else and making God the source of your security and significance. So where is it in your life that you're living in a constant state of frustration? You can never see the good come. You feel like you're withering and you're dry. Maybe it's in that area where you have not fully trusted God as your source of security and significance. God says that when we trust Him with all our heart, He promises to direct our paths and sustain our steps. He will. And so listen, even as parents, as students, in our careers, in our relationships, in our successes, in our failures, in all of it, when we lean on Him, He moves. The only question is this, are you trusting God with every aspect of your life? You see that trusting there, what Jeremiah was saying, represents full, complete faith where you're, you're leaning on it. It's like 
when I go and I lean on that wall, I'm not even going to second guess it about holding up my weight. I'm going to lean on it, all my weight on it. God is wanting you to do that to him today. And can I tell you, he has proven to us over and over and over again that he can withstand the weight of your life. He can withstand the, the weight of the security and significance that you're looking for. Would you, would you lean on him? Would you lean not on your own understanding, as the proverb says, but trust in him and acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. See, for God to direct your paths and give you the security and the significance that you're looking for, he's waiting on you to lean on him. He's waiting on you to trust in him. Are you trusting in him? Are you leaning on him? So listen, to be a faithful and fruitful Christian is determined by the location and source of your trust, Jeremiah says. Which tree are you? Listen to what Billy Graham says. There's this video go around of, of him of him preaching. I love Billy Graham. I used to, when I was a teenager and I felt the call to ministry, I would just watch YouTube clips of Billy Graham and just be amazed by his passion and his love for people in the gospel. I was just amazed by it. And there's this video going around of him preaching from Habakkuk, and it says, he's still on the throne, and those of us that know him put our trust in him and him alone, he says. He says, I don't put my trust in Washington. I don't put my trust in the United Nations. I don't put my trust in myself. I don't put my trust in my money. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When all the rest of it fails and crumbles and shatters, because it will, he says, he'll be there. He'll be there. That is comforting words. He'll be there. But listen, how do we begin to trust in the Lord? How do we do this thing? How do we trust in him? Listen to what Jeremiah says in 17.9, and it's, it's not so good news. It's, it's not the news we're hoping for. Because Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? That's great news, right? It's not. It's bad news. Because he's even saying we can't even trust our feelings at times. Sometimes our feelings lie to us. He says we can't trust our hearts. The second thing we need to do for us to trust in the Lord, what do we need? To trust in the Lord, we need a new heart to bear this fruit. To bear the fruit that God wants us to bear, we need a new heart so that we can place our trust in him. You see, we are naturally inclined to trust our own strength, aren't we? Or in something we can control. To be able to trust God completely, you first need an accurate view of your heart. You need to see your heart rightly, and in ourselves, we can't do it. Jeremiah, he uses these words, he says, your heart is deceitful. It's incurable. And it's impossible to understand. And so your heart will deceive you in trusting in yourself and human strength. It will. Your heart will tell you, you need to trust in your own strength and your own abilities. Work harder, try harder, be better. Trust in this person to make life better for you. Well, the world says, you ever heard the saying, just follow your heart. What is your, what is your heart telling you to do? Well, then do what your heart's telling you to do. But Jeremiah says, well, there's a problem with that. Your heart is deceitful. It can lie to you. It's incurable. And you can't understand it. So the advice just follow your heart is actually bad advice. You know, there's a thing in our culture that says just center yourself to gain control of your feelings and remind yourself that you have balance and control. Just center yourself and remind yourself that, that you actually have balance and control where Jeremiah says that's not good advice because your heart is deceitful. You actually don't have as much control as you think you do. You're sick on the inside, he says. And so... But what if my heart is deceitful and lead me astray? Listen, we can't trust our feelings. Listen, our greatest problem is not that we're not strong enough. We may think, well, I'm not strong enough to handle this. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't recognize how weak we are and how powerful God is. That's our biggest problem. Our problem is not that you're not strong enough to handle the things of life and to bear this fruit. It's that we haven't recognized how weak we actually are and how powerful he is. Listen, not only do we not recognize it, Jeremiah says we're unable to do it on our own. We can't even recognize that we have an issue. As Paul David Tripp says, he says that you're blind to your blindness. We are blind to our blindness. It's like, um, you know, for some reason, when I eat salad, I get lettuce in my teeth. And it drives Allie insane. 
She's like, you got a piece of lettuce in that crevice again. And I'm, you know, trying to get it out. And, you know, what if it's like she tells me that? I'm like, no, I don't. I just go around talking to people and smiling. And people are like, oh, you got a disgusting piece of lettuce in your teeth. And they're trying to tell me, but I can't see it myself. See, that's what God is saying. He's saying you have a major problem and you can't see it yourself. You don't even know there's a problem. You don't even know there is. And so Paul David Tripp will say we're blind to even our blindness. And so there's no way that you can determine on your own whether or not you are a fruit-bearing follower of Jesus. You can't do it. You can't in yourself say, you know what? Well, I am being a fruit-bearing follower of Jesus. I am bearing fruit for his kingdom. Because the results are always skewed with the optimism of my own perceived goodness, isn't it? I always skew the the results and say, well, I'm doing better than so-and-so here, and I'm producing this while they're not producing that. Listen, in myself, I'm unable to to see if I'm a fruit-bearing Christian or not. And so the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can understand it? And listen, this is an insurmountable problem to take on by yourself, isn't it? It is. And so to fully trust in God, we need a new heart. And Jeremiah says, and we can't do it on our own. So what do we need? Jeremiah says in 17, verse 10, he says, I, the Lord, examine the mind. I test the heart. That's the good news we need today. So God knows us more than we know ourselves, is what Jeremiah is saying. God knows you more than you know yourself. God knows me more than I know me. So here's the thing. God, I can't, and I couldn't if I tried, but God knows and he can. God knows and he can. Listen, we can't read or trust our hearts. We can't know ourselves, but God does. And the phrase here, test the mind, the the literal translation is test the kidneys, which is kind of disgusting. But in Hebrew, it's it's kind of an expression meaning that God knows the deepest and most secret parts of who you are. God knows the most deepest and secret part of who you are. And so there's nothing in our lives hidden from him. He knows it all. He knows right now where your trust actually lies. He does. Even when you're unable to to think, well, my trust is in the Lord. He knows your heart when you're not trusting in him. And so, what is Jeremiah saying? He's saying, although you are unable to perceive your heart rightly to see if you're a fruit-bearing Christian or not, but God can. Jeremiah is not only declaring truth. Listen, as Phil and the band come up, I want you to listen to this. God is not declaring truth, only declaring a truth right now. What is he doing? He's extending an invitation to the Israelites to turn their trust from themselves and others to God alone. It's an invitation to get out of the desert that you are living in and be replanted by streams of water where your life will never cease to bear fruit, where your leaves will always be green. He's inviting them. He's saying, you can't do this on your own. You have, you're sick. You're sick on the inside, and you don't even know you're sick. He says, but I know you're sick. I can do for you what you can't do for yourself. So not only is he declaring truth that you're sick and you can't do anything to cure yourself, he's inviting them. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. I will examine, and I will show you where you're weak and where I am strong, he says. So he's inviting us. So this morning, will will we accept that invitation to come to God this morning? Listen, God will always answer a cry for healing and salvation. Listen to how Jeremiah, he ends this. Although the Israelites rejected Jeremiah's invitation to come to him, they rejected it. But there was one person who who accepted this invitation, and it was Jeremiah alone. The one who spoke this invitation was the one who accepted this invitation. Listen to what he says in verse 14. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Listen, he says, God will always answer a cry for healing and salvation. This morning, if you feel like a dry and withered shrub in the desert, what you need most today is to be replanted. To be replanted beside a river. Listen to what Jesus says in John 7. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out. What did he cry out? He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within them. Listen, Jesus is speaking to a bunch of self-righteous people who are like a shrub in a desert, and they're unable to save themselves. What is keeping you today from crying out to Jesus to be your Savior and to accept that invitation? Can I tell you, like Jeremiah says, he already knows. He already knows. What does that mean? 
that nothing about me that can be revealed that is not already covered by the blood of Jesus. So if we think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with, with God and, and let him know how dry I really am and he's just going to push me to the side. No, can I tell you, he already knows and it's already covered by the blood of Jesus. We just sang this song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Lean. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Where is your trust this morning? Where is the location of your trust and your source? Listen, it cannot be in mankind. It cannot be in flesh. It cannot be in your abilities. It has to be in in the Lord and the Lord alone. Jesus is a firm foundation. Are you standing and leaning on Jesus this morning? Or are you trying to do it yourself? And listen, if we are deceiving ourselves, if we think, I'm I'm a fruit-bearing Christian, have you allowed God into your heart to show you the areas where you're not? And said, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you, like Jeremiah says. If I cry out for healing, you'll heal me. If I cry out for salvation, you'll save me. What's keeping you today from not trusting Him as your Lord and Savior? Would you bow with me? Father, we love you so much, and we're so thankful for your word this morning. God, forgive us for where our trust is not in you. God, as Paul says, God will not... He says, don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. And so, Lord, I I pray if we're deceived, Lord, that the scales would fall off our eyes. And, Lord, we will truly see what's in our heart. God, forgive us for acting like everything's okay when it's not. And so, Lord, I pray that this altar is full of people repenting, saying, God, forgive me for trusting in myself to do this. Forgive me for trusting in someone else or something else other than you. God, I don't want to be a shrub in the desert looking for substance. I want to be a tree planted by living water. I need another source outside of myself. Father, move and do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, this is your time. Would you stand and worship? Or would you come to the altar and have a moment of repentance with the Father? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will. church. Well, I hope that you were blessed by the word. You were encouraged. that We can put our hope and trust in him and him alone. And we'll be like a tree planted. And even when the heat comes, we won't fear it. When the drought comes, we won't be afraid. And we'll still bear our fruit. And we'll see the good that comes even in the midst of terrible circumstances. Look, I know right now we need to be the church more than ever. The world is crying out for a better alternative. They're hungry for something different. So let me challenge you to do something this week. Find a way to where we can love our neighbor the way that Jesus loved us. Go read Luke 10 in the Good Samaritan. Let's be the church that God has called us to be. Amen? Amen. Let me pray and you can be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, help us this week to to be the church that you've called us to be. That is You are our trust in in you alone. Not in ourselves or somebody else, but in you. In Jesus' name, amen.